I have an advantage over all of you this morning because I know what you are thinking. All of you are thinking, why in the world are we stuck with this guy? Where is Pastor Chad? Well, I have another advantage because I know where Pastor Chad is as well. He's been ill, as has his wife and one of his two boys. So let's keep them in our prayers. So you are stuck with me. I'm Rocky Feimster. I have the privilege of serving as one of the elders here at Grace Point. It's good to see all of you this morning. And I want to echo what Bill just said. I really encourage you all to come to Adult Bible Fellowship those of you that are adults, or at least act like them, uh, to come to Adult Bible Fellowship every Sunday at 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall. <clears throat> Have any of you ever wished that you could be in two places at once? Don't you wish that sometimes, when you have to make a choice about where to be? Back in the mid-90s, there was a movie that... Uh, starred Michael Keaton, I think it was. It was called uh, Multiplicity, and it was about a construction worker who was just overwhelmed with all of the things he had to do and didn't have enough time to do them all, so he got himself cloned. And, of course, it didn't turn out exactly as he expected, but that's, uh, that was the, the, the goal that he had, was be able to do everything. If you could be in two places at once, just think about it. You could be at work and still be catching up on your sleep at the same time. Or you could have two jobs, you know, make twice as much money, right? You could do that. If it was me, I'd probably just goof off twice as much, you know. I'd probably uh, watch two programs on TV at the same time. And I wouldn't be a couch potato, I'd be couch potatoes. Uh, you know, you think of t occasions in life where you wish that you could... Okay, I'm going to use this one. We, we're trying this out, this, this thing here, and apparently it's not working, so I'm a guinea pig. <clears throat> I'm a couch guinea pig. <clears throat> you think about occasions in life where you wish people could be in more place than once. I remember when we took my oldest son to college. This was August of 2006. Uh, my oldest son, Holt, my wife and I drove him down. He was... He went to UT San Antonio his first year before he transferred to the University of Texas. And uh, I remember standing there in the parking lot with him, thinking about what advice I should give, wishing that he could come back with us. I wanted him to be there, but I wanted him to be home. And I'll tell you what the advice I gave him was, don't do anything that will embarrass your mother and she embarrasses easily. <clears throat> I'm not sure he followed that advice, although we didn't hear about any other occurrence. But it would have been nice to have him in two places, right? I'll tell you a story on myself, which may make you think less of me. Some of you can't think any less of me, but some of you might. In 1975, the spring of 1975, I was in my second year of college at the University of Texas. And uh, I was dating a girl who, went to, who was a senior in high school at in Corpus Christi Ray. Now, I wasn't robbing the cradle, you know. She was only a year younger than I was. At the same time, my brother was a senior at Corpus Christi Carroll, and he was on the basketball team. And they had a special team that year. They were really one of the best teams, probably the best team that Carroll High School has ever had. They were rated second in the state. And of course, they made the playoffs. They were scheduled to play a playoff game in San Antonio the very same night that this girl I was dating was having her senior prom in Corpus Christi. I had to be in San Antonio and I had to be in Corpus Christi at the same time. How many of you think I should have gone to the basketball game? Raise your hand. And how many of you think I should have gone to the senior prom? Raise your hand. You people don't know me very well. I went to the basketball game. And it didn't cause us to break up. I still dated that girl for about a year. This is before I met my wife, by the way, so it was all okay. But I dated her for about a year. I haven't spoken to her in 45 years. My brother is still my brother. I made the right choice. In fact, he's sitting right there. 
But you want to be in two places at once if you can. We know it's, I mean, another example, and, and, and then I'll move on, but I, I, some of you know, I, I don't know that I've ever mentioned this before, but I'm a baseball fan. And I coach baseball. I coach youth baseball. In fact, one of my players is in the audience right now. And uh, a couple, three years ago, I was coaching a team of 10-year-olds, and it was pretty grim. The league decided to favor me with five kids who had never, ever played before. Uh, and I had one kid on my team who could throw a strike. And I had one kid on my team who could play catcher behind the plate. And it was the same kid. Wouldn't it have been great for him to pitch to himself? <laughs> Actually, it would have been great if I'd had nine of that kid, to be honest. <clears throat> we know that it's not possible in the physical realm to be two places at once. Now, we can certainly have our physical body in one place and our mind in another. Many of you are in that position right now. I get it. But Jesus brings up this very subject with the disciples in our passage today. In this passage, he tells them that he is leaving, at least in human form. And why does he do that? We'll get to that in a minute. At its most basic, Jesus in human form, his body was limited as we are. He could not be two places at once. And so we read in the second part of verse 4 through 6, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So he says, where are you going? And no, nobody asked me that. That's a simple question. Why did nobody ask him? Well, some of you may remember, if you're really sharp, that in chapter 13, Peter did say, well, where are you going? But that wasn't really because he wanted to know where Jesus was going. That was because he claimed he was going to follow him. And that, you'll recall that famous passage where Jesus tells him, no, you're going to deny me three times before morning shows up. In this case, why didn't they want to know where he was going? Was there, was they, were they focusing on their own issues? Was there a lack of understanding about his plans? Probably both of those things. We know now what he was talking about. In the short term, he was talking about going to uh, arrest and trial, and imprisonment, and torture, and death on a cross. And in the long term, he was talking about resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father. That's what his focus is here. I'm going to be gone pretty soon. I'm going to be up there. You're going to be left down here. And then he says, sorrow has filled your heart. Well, why do you think the disciples would be filled with sorrow about that? Well, it's It's, it's simple. Why was I sad that my son was leaving? They, they had come to rely on Jesus. They had come to love him. They had come to expect him to be there, to lead them, to direct him, to guide them. They, they, they certainly would miss him from an emotional standpoint. We all are familiar with that. We are all familiar with separation from somebody that we love. We all know that. Was it because they were confused about what would happen next? They were they were lacking a sense of direction. They were rudderless, if you will. They don't know what to do. Well, the fact is, they did know what to do. It's just that they didn't know that they knew what to do yet. <clears throat> and it, it kind of depends, I think, on your, on your theory about, you know, leaving. Is it a short-term or a long-term thing? In the short term, they would have been terrified to think that Jesus would be arrested and tried and crucified. In the long term, he's ascending to heaven to be with the Father, and that would make them feel better. Of, oftentimes, unfortunately, we focus on the short-term effects of separation. My sadness at my son leaving college, and of course, I had five kids, and they all went to college, and they all left. It wasn't quite as bad with the others as it was with the first. Pretty tough when my daughters did, I will admit that. But you get used to it, right? <laughs> Uh, when I left to come to Dallas, and I'll remember it was tax day, April the 15th, 1981, I left Central Texas where I had been working, where I had lived for a number of years to move to Dallas. That was a heartbreaking day for me. It was the best decision I ever made. At the time, it didn't seem like it. If you focus on the short term, you forget the long-term benefits. The, the, most, the best example of this is the death of a loved one. 
When a loved one dies, we all feel terrible about it. We don't, we don't look at the long term. This is a tough week for me for that reason. My, my father died 10 years ago on March the 17th. My mother died 26 years ago on March the 24th. This third week of March is a tough week for me because I think about both of them every day. Now, when I think about them, it brings a smile. But it wasn't always that way. So this is the, the issue. They were focused on the short term. He would be gone and they would be without him. Let's go on to verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. As we indicated, it's, it's natural to feel sorrow when someone leaves. And it's interesting what Jesus says about this. He says, it's to your benefit that I'm leaving. Now, if you have a, a loved one who's got a terrible disease and is in the throes of pain and suffering and misery and is about to die, you, you almost always think, you know what, it'll be better for them when they actually pass on to glory, right? You feel that way. But you don't feel that way about yourself. It's not to your personal advantage that your loved one is gone because you'll miss them. It's just like, you know, that that when I separated from everything I knew in Central Texas, you know, that did not seem to my advantage at the time. As I said earlier, that's the best decision I ever made. I met my wife, the best person in the whole world, and those of you that know her know I'm being truthful about that. That would not have happened if I'd have stayed where I was. I wouldn't have had the five great children. I, well, great, I mean, I wouldn't have had the five so-so children I have. What's the phrase, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased? I, these are my five children in whom I am moderately pleased. <laughs> what about Abraham leaving his country and going to a land he did not know? Well, that took a step of faith, didn't it? And at the time, there was probably a lot of sorrow and there was a lot of angst about that. And guess what? He became the father of many nations through which the tribe of Judah came through which the plan of redemption was fulfilled. So it is to their advantage. Well, why was it to the disciples' advantage? Why? Wouldn't you want Jesus there personally? They certainly did. I mean, wouldn't you want Jesus to walk through this door right now and take the pulpit over from me? I mean, anybody would want that, right? Actually, I think if that happened, some of us would be awful nervous, including your present speaker, if Jesus were up here talking to us. How in the world are they actually better off? How is it to their advantage? Well, I'll tell you. It's to their advantage because of a number of reasons. Separation leads to, sometimes, hopefully, it leads to growth. It leads to a positive development. I, I, I've used the example of my son going to college. Well, it was good for him to do that, certainly, but it was also good for me. You need to learn, as a parent, you need to learn to let go. <laughs> and I'll tell you, one of the greatest moments of my life was when my college-aged son called me on the phone to ask me for my advice. He was never interested in it when he lived at home. <laughs> it was to my advantage to let go. It was to my advantage to see him develop and grow as a person. Now, the Holy Spirit is going to come, and that's the advantage that the disciples have. They're about to be sent out into the world, and they're going to be on the front lines of spreading the gospel. Honestly, could they have done that if Jesus were still there physically in person? Jesus could not physically be with each one of them all the time wherever they went. That could not have happened. He can't be with John and James in Jerusalem and not still be with Peter in Joppa and Caesarea. He can't do that. But with the Holy Spirit, the helper, he would help them testify and witness to Christ. Instead of the physical person of Jesus, when, he, when he's physically present, 
They now have the Spirit of God all the time, no matter where they are. That's to their advantage. They had, he, Jesus had a plan that they didn't understand, and this was part of it. Look at, look at these apostles before Jesus left for heaven. They were confused. They were kind of a band of miscreants, right? They were self-centered. Who's going to sit on your right hand when you come into your kingdom? They were selfish, if you will. They were, they were not focused. After he left and the Holy Spirit came, they were bold. They were focused. They were completely sold out to the gospel. They were successful in spreading the gospel. If we emulate the instructions that Jesus gave to the disciples, if we were to do that, we would clearly be to our advantage. Jesus now in his spirit, the Holy Spirit, can be with every believer all the time. That's to our advantage. If Jesus were still living on the world today, physically, I'm talking physically, people would follow him around and write down everything he said. You know, the, the scriptures already tell us that if you wrote down everything he did, you, the, the world couldn't contain all the books. Well, we are now have the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to guide us as we read those. That's to our advantage. We now have a trusting, or we should, have a trusting relationship with God. If Jesus were here in person today, if he'd lived on the last 2,000 years, what would we be doing? We'd be following him around, watching everything. It would be difficult to trust in God. We, would be tr we wouldn't be living by faith. We would be living by sight, which is backwards. It's to our advantage. The Scriptures in 2 Corinthians 5.16 tells us, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. That was Paul writing to the church in Corinth about Christ having gone to glory and his spirit now pervading our lives. It's to our advantage we don't have the temptation or that temptation to walk by sight instead of faith. Jesus is now enthroned in heaven, and it's important for believers to understand that. His work was finished on the cross, and that was to our advantage. Let's move on to verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I know many of you are shocked to hear when you come to church on Sunday morning that you're going to hear about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Unfortunately, there are many churches in the world today where you never hear about that. Well, this is what Jesus was all about, and this is what he told the disciples. He said that the Holy Spirit will come, and he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I used to be a prosecutor. I'm a, I, I practice law for a living now. Uh, when I first started as a lawyer, I was a prosecutor. My job was to prosecute persons accused of a crime. And the ultimate goal was a conviction, a finding of guilt. I used to say I was, I was putting them in, I wasn't getting them out. <laughs> well, the word here to convict in the original Greek is a little bit different. It does mean a finding of guilt. But it also means to expose or to refute or to convince. The Holy Spirit is here to expose sin, to convince us that we need righteousness, okay? To convince us that there's judgment. All of those things. The first one, let's talk about sin, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Now, be honest. We're in church, so you'd be honest. When you hear the word sin, you're thinking about stuff like, well, murder and lying and thievery and sexual sin of all kinds, things like that. That's what you're thinking of. Or maybe the seven deadly sins. I, I once tried out for a game show, and I, one, of the, one of the questions that you had to answer was, what are the seven deadly sins? Well, there's sloth, pride, anger, gluttony, greed, 
lust and envy. I'm intimately familiar with many of those, as, so, as some of you are. Well, those sins, that's what you're thinking of when you hear sin, but that's, that's not what Jesus talks about here. That's not what he says. He says concerning sin because they do not believe in me. If you ask the man on the street, what is sin, what's he going to say? Well, he's going to say, well, it's doing something wrong or it's doing something bad. But that's not the complete definition of sin, right? It's a failure to, to comply with God's standard. It also includes not doing something right that it's in your power to do. We see that in James chapter 4. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him that is sin. But that's not what Jesus mentions here at all. He's not talking about the sin of murder as bad as that is or the sin of adultery as bad as that is or the sin of lying or thievery or coveting or any of that. He's not talking about any of that. He's not talking about failing to do something right that you have power to do. He's not talking about that either. He's talking about one thing. Because you do not believe in me. There is only one deadly sin, the sin that definitely keeps you out of heaven, keeps you from experiencing a relationship with God for eternity, and that is a failure to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's it. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of. You know, many of you have heard the Scripture. It's in Luke chapter 10 that the deadly sin is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And we know in John chapter 15, we just read that here a couple of weeks ago, that the Holy Spirit will bear witness about, God, about Jesus Christ. The deadly sin is a failure to believe the Holy Spirit about the person of Jesus Christ. Not believing in Christ is the deadly sin. Rejecting that message is calling the Holy Spirit a liar. He's blaspheming. Now, <clears throat> That's not a popular thing to say nowadays in our culture, that you have to believe in Christ. You know, we, we have this universalist view, I think, in our culture that, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe it. <laughs> well, it does matter what you believe, at least according to the Bible. The Bible tells us that you have to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have to do that. If you don't, you're condemned. We see that in John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. For God did not, and we all know John 3, 16. I mean, even non-believers can quote that one. Let's talk about the next two. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. There's two parts. If you believe, you're saved. If you don't believe, you're condemned. I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible. That's what the Scriptures tell us. The only thing that brings eternal damnation is not believing in, the, in, in Christ's provision for your salvation. That's it. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't make other sins okay. <laughs> You know, once you're saved, the, 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 the Spirit is in the process of sanctifying us, and we are to avoid sin. We're to become more and more like Christ if we can. I'm not suggesting that it's okay to commit any other sin. That's not it. And, you know, Paul talks about that a lot. But the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, and the sin that he convicts the world of is a failure to believe in Jesus Christ. If you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have to make a choice to do that. The Holy Spirit's work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. The second thing is of righteousness in verse 10. Of righteousness because I go to the Father, you see me no more. We talk about this, you know, and, and a good example is in John chapter 11, the story of uh, Lazarus and Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. You remember that story. Lazarus dies. Jesus sort of tarried for a few days in some other location after he heard that Lazarus was sick, and, Je and Lazarus dies. 
And so Jesus comes to Bethany, and Martha runs out to meet him, and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And what does he say to her? He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way and the revelation. Do you believe this? That's the question of the hour. Do you believe this? Of righteousness, because I go to the Father. Well, what is righteousness? You know, many of you can look around the room, and you can find a man or a woman in the room, and you can say, well, you know, that's kind of a righteous person. Because why? Why do you think that? Because of the way they act or the way they talk? Is righteousness a lack of sinning? Is it always doing the right thing? Is it a particular standard of behavior that you must follow? Well, that's an issue because the right thing has changed throughout history and throughout different cultures in the world throughout time. You know, cultural and geographical norms determine what is righteous in particular areas of the world. There are varying standards of behavior, varying standards of righteousness that have been established by men today. We're, we've reached a point in our culture where if you say certain things, people think you're not righteous. And you may not be. I'm not, I'm not even arguing with that. I'm just saying that's sort of the standard now, what you think, what you say. I'll give a personal example. In 1984, I was lucky enough to visit Israel. I went with a group from a church that I was attending. And um, we were talking about separation earlier. One of the fellows that went with me on that, on that uh, visit to Israel, he died this week. His funeral is tomorrow in Louisville. Went to Israel. We went to Nazareth. We went to the Church of the Annunciation, which is the location, they will tell you, where Gabriel appeared to Mary. <laughs> I don't guess they really know, but if you go to Israel and there's anything that claims to have any kind of connection with the Bible, there's either some kind of synagogue, church, or mosque built on top of it, you know. So there's a church there. And as you ascend the hill to go to the church, there's all these billboards along the side of the road that were put there by Muslims who try to convince Christians not to visit because there's only one God and his name is Allah, which is, of course, not true. There is only one God, but he's a trinity. And that's what they claim is, well, you're claiming there's more than one God because you believe in the trinity and Jesus is not the son of God, etc. all of that. So they try to dissuade you. Well, we went anyway. We went up there. And in the Church of the Annunciation, it's a beautiful church. I can't remember what particular sect of of church of the it was it was run by an orthodox group and I can't remember what particular sect it was but they had icons all over the wall and there was an altar and there were candles burning and it was just a beautiful place and I was walking around looking at the things with my hands in my pocket and I noticed that the leader of our tour group was over there in the corner with uh, the guy who ran the church and uh, then the leader of the tour uh, group came over to me and he says you're going to have to leave unless you take your hands out of your pocket. I was somehow disrespecting the church because I had my hands in my pocket. That was a standard of righteousness that I had no idea about and certainly was not within my contemplation to disrespect the church. I'm sure my picture's on the wall there somewhere and I can't go in now when I go back. Well, that's just an example. I mean, it, it seems foolish, doesn't it? But to them, that was a serious thing. You cannot be righteous enough. We measure righteousness by comparing our behavior to others. I'm better than him. I wouldn't do that. Well, guess what? Somebody else is saying the same thing about you. We can convince ourselves of our own righteousness by looking at the faults of others. Well, isn't that, what, isn't that the very story of the, that Jesus gave of the prayers of the Pharisee and the tax collector, thank God I am not like that tax collector over there. Well, who went home justified in that story? It was the tax collector. In, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, it tells us, unless our righteousness, the scribes and the fair, of the Pharisee, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you are not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, I'm sure when the disciples heard that, they thought, man, I'll just go back to fishing. No. Jesus is saying that the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is not even enough. 
the Holy Spirit shows us that the only standard of righteousness that is sufficient is the standard of Jesus Christ himself. The ascension to heaven by Jesus shows that he perfectly fulfilled his Father's will, and he had proven himself righteous. Nobody else is in that category. The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness by showing that the righteousness is not of men but of Jesus Christ. The only righteousness that God the Father will accept is the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. He has to take our place at the judgment. And that's what He did through His work on the cross. No matter how moral or honest or good a person you are, and I understand there may be a couple of you in the room, no matter how moral or good or honest you are, it is not enough. You cannot make it on your own. The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness because Jesus goes to the Father because that's the only righteousness that's good enough, and he has to take our place. Well, then in verse 11, it tells us that he convicts us concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, this is not a reference to the judgment of the believer versus the unbeliever or even the judgment of Christians at the judgment seat when rewards are passed out. This is a judgment of the devil himself. Satan has great power in the world. That power has been defeated by Jesus Christ. That power is over with. Some of you are old enough to remember back in the 60s and 70s, a television program uh, featured a comedian by the name of Flip Wilson. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because then you're telling everybody how old you are. But remember what his famous line was? It was, the devil made me do it. And some of you are chuckling right now when you hear that. It's not funny when I say it, but the way he said it and the context in which he said it and the the circumstances in which he said it, it was funny. But guess what? It's not funny. The devil does make us do it a lot, and it's not funny, okay? We concede power to the devil that he does not deserve. That's what Adam Adam gave the devil power in the garden when he sinned. And we see a world in rebellion against God as a result. People all over the world and every place around the globe, they fail to acknowledge God. They even mock God. Many are under the power of Satan. They're blinded by his power. They're, in effect, prisoners. Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. They may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. One day that will be resolved. We will live In a world that God intended, the lion with the lamb, streams in the desert, rivers in high places, no physical maladies. You've heard all of that in in, uh, Isaiah chapters 11, 35, 41. Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. All of that is coming. And what does that mean now? What it means now is we don't have to be under Satan's power. We're not perfect. I'm not suggesting that. We can't be perfect. But we should be advancing toward that goal of being like Jesus Christ, of emulating Jesus Christ. We don't have to be bondage, in bondage to corruption and to evil thoughts and actions. The power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit has saved you if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. He has died for you, and you should not allow Satan to have control of your life. And we need to try to reach other people that are that way, that are under the control of Satan, under bondage, and tell them, look, Jesus died for you. You don't have to be under Satan's control. Well, let's move on, verses 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He says, you can't bear some of these things now. They're not ready to hear some of the things he's going to be telling them. He talks about the spirit of truth and the Holy Spirit guiding them into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare the things to come. It says he will guide you into all the truth. Well, that doesn't mean you make an A on every test you take, okay? But what it does mean is that you know all the truth you need to know about your salvation. The Holy Spirit will guide you into that. 
He bears witness to the ultimate truth, who Jesus is and what Jesus did. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. It's also specific truth to your daily life. People want to know, well, how do I know God's will, you know? Well, you might consult with God occasionally <laughs> by praying. You might read the Scriptures. You might talk with other persons who are, who are, are Christians, who have your best interests at heart. You might listen to what God is saying to you. The Holy Spirit will never guide you incorrectly, and He will certainly never guide you in a way that's contrary to the Word of God. He talks about glorifying, and the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. He takes him on His mind and declares to you. He's just telling the disciples, what the Holy Spirit puts in your heart is from me. Just another example of the Trinity. What the Holy Spirit puts in your heart is from me. All that he declares is from the Father's mind. If I take what is mine and declare it to you, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to us about Jesus. If you ever in your life receive any truth from God, and I hope you have and I hope you continue to do so, it's because the Holy Spirit gave it to you. It's not because you're smart. It's not because you're good. You may be smart and you may be good, but that's not the reason. The reason is because it came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus because He speaks with the authority of God Himself. He takes what Jesus did. He declares it to you. When Jesus says, all things the Father has are mine, what does that mean? It means, well, it either means He's the Son of God or He's crazy. I mean, that's crazy talk, isn't it? All the all things the Father has is mine? Well, He's the Son of God. That's what the Scriptures tell us. The Holy Spirit makes sure that we are exposed to truth of Jesus. He convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's not crazy talk. It's the truth that all of you need to know. You must believe in Christ. You must confess your need for a Savior and recognize that God provided that Savior through the personhood of Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit is speaking those truths to you in your heart, then you need to respond. This is eternity we're talking about, and the Holy Spirit knows all about eternity. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, we pray this morning for your Spirit to come upon us, to be in this place, to anoint us with truth, with knowledge, with the desire to do your will. We ask that you give us knowledge of your will and the courage to do it. Amen.